Hi, Reverend Tolliver. How are you? Hi, how are you? I'm okay. Nice to see you. You just reminded me I need to change back. Good to see you also. Do we wait for to be told to start? I think we've got our first uh, presenter here and our second, so I think we're fine from attendance. Um, Kamal and uh, tech, tech support, are we ready? Uh, yeah, we're live streaming, so we're good to go. Thank you. Okay. Good, good afternoon. The Commission on Chicago Landmarks Program Committee meeting is now called to order. My name is the Reverend Richard Tolliver. I am a member of the commission and serve as chair of the program committee. I will be presiding over the meeting today. My fellow commissioner, Sue Ellen Burns, also serves on the program committee. Commissioner Burns, would you please introduce yourself? Hello, thank you everyone for being here. Last year, Governor Pritzker 
signed Public Act 101-0640, making certain amendments to the Open Meetings Act, so we, along with other boards and commissions, can continue to host virtual meetings during this COVID-19 public health emergency, provided that certain conditions are met. One of those conditions is that Chairman Wong, as head of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks, determines that an in-person meeting of the Program Committee of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks is not practical or prudent. I want to make sure our virtual meeting meets all the conditions of the Open Meeting Act as amended. Therefore, I want to state, pursuant to the newly created Section 7E2 of the Open Meetings Act, that Chairman Wong determined that an in-person meeting of this program committee is not practical or prudent. Similarly, Chairman Wong decided, pursuant to Section 7E5, that because of the disaster as declared by the governor, it is unfeasible for at least one member of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks or its chief administrative officer or its legal officer to be physically present at the meeting place in as much as there is no physical meeting place. Pursuant to a resolution adopted by the Commission on Chicago Landmarks on June 7th, June 4th, 2020, regarding the chairman's emergency rulemaking powers, Chairman Wong issued emergency rules governing the conduct of remote public commission meetings and posted on and provisions for remote public participation effective February 18th, 2022. These rules are posted on the commission's website. In line with these emergency rules, today's program committee meeting is a virtual meeting being simulcast to the general public via live streaming. Because today's program committee meeting is being held virtually, it has been structured to minimize the chances for technical difficulties. Aside from those who have submitted either national register nominations or landmark suggestions for consideration at today's meeting, members of the general public have been encouraged to submit written statements in advance of the meeting. Any comments received have been posted on the commission's website and are available for viewing at www.chicago.gov slash CCL. Individuals or representatives for organizations owning properties nominated for national register status will be able to speak after the presentation on the property if so desired. Individuals who submitted suggestions for Chicago landmark designation by the September 9th deadline communicated with staff regarding their desire to speak and will be able to do so today. The program committee is a standing committee of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks. Its main purposes are to give an opportunity for national register nominations to be heard and for the public to make suggestions for new City of Chicago landmark designations. The committee will first review three nominations to the National Register of Historic Places. After this review, the committee will then go through the suggestions submitted for Chicago landmark designation. Before we begin, however, are there any members of the general public, not including those individuals making national register presentations or who have submitted suggestions, who would like to speak today? If so, I would like to call upon you now. Please raise your hand. 
function of Zoom to indicate this. Members of the public not using a smartphone or computer and instead phoning into the meeting should press star nine to activate the raise hand function and do the same to deactivate it. I or the meeting facilitator will call out the names of people who raised their hands one by one and they will be unmuted. Once unmuted, speakers should give their full name and organization, if any, they represent. Please limit your comments to three minutes. Uh, is there anyone to speak? Chairman, can you hear me? It's Yes. Um, uh, Chairman Tolliver, Commissioner Burns, I'm Ward Miller, uh, Executive Director of Preservation Chicago, and we wish at Preservation Chicago to support all three nominations to the National Register of Historic uh, Places presented today before the Program Committee of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks, including the Muddy Waters House. Um, we were honored to work with Chandra Cooper, Muddy Waters' great-granddaughter, towards a landmark designation and a revisioning of this building as a public museum. We very much support this nomination. Also with Stone Temple Baptist Church, we were honored to work with Bishop Fitzpatrick and the congregation towards a Chicago landmark designation of this historic church and former synagogue, which was a spiritual home to Dr. King when he was in Chicago and so tied to the civil rights movement. And we again support the nomination to the National Register of the Schlitz, Bury, and Tide House at 96th, 95th and Ewing. Uh, we worked uh, with Mike Medina and Laura Medina on this property. Uh, and, and, and this is now a Chicago landmark included in a group of former Schlitz, Bury, and Tide Houses. And we are very honored to see these three buildings, not only as designated Chicago landmarks, but being nominated to uh, the National Register of Historic Places. So with our full support of Preservation Chicago, uh, we very much um, encourage uh, these to move forward through the process, your approval, and that of the ISAC committee in Springfield. And we are grateful, grateful to be part of uh, these three nominations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Tolliver? Yes. Um, I, I'd also be speaking on the Washington Park National Bank and um, the South Chicago Masonic Temple, but I'll leave that up to you as to when to call. Uh, I'll call on you when we arrive. At Thank that you. Place. Thank you, sir. Sure. Is there another speaker? If that is everyone who wants to speak, we will now move to the agenda. I'd like to give some background about the commission's review of National Register nominations. The National Register is a federal program that recognizes historically and architecturally significant properties. The commission gets a chance to review and comment on National Register nominations for Chicago properties because Chicago is a certified local government under the National Historic Preservation Act. After the full commission's review, these nominations will be heard by the Illinois Historic Sites Advisory Council. Today, we will be considering three National Register nominations. I will call the name of the person making the presentation. After they are done, if property owners are present, I'd like to give them a chance to say a few words, should they so desire. When your name is called, please turn on your video and unmute yourself so we can see and hear you. When the next agenda item is called, please turn your video off and mute yourself again. We would appreciate your remaining on mute unless your agenda item is being discussed so as to avoid unnecessary background noise during the meeting. The first nomination is for the Muddy Waters House, 
located at 4339 South Lake Park Avenue. The nomination was prepared by Erica Ruggiero from McGuire Igleski, if I mispronounce it, please correct me, and Associates, and she will make the presentation. Great, thank you, Chairman Tolliver. Um, for, the, for the slides, are, I provided them. Should I share them or will staff share them? Uh, someone else needs to answer that question. <laughs> I'll be sharing them. Just give me a second here. Sure, thanks. <laughs> Sorry. No, no worries. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. yes. Great. Just tell Alvin. me what to advance. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Candlin. Um, so I'm Erica Ruggiero with the Historic Preservation Architecture Firm of McGuire Glesky and Associates. And uh, we were hired to prepare the National Register nomination for the Muddy Waters House um, by the Muddy Waters Mojo Museum and specifically uh, Ms. Sandra, Chandra Cooper, who is the great granddaughter of Muddy Waters. So um, it's been a really wonderful kind of project um, to say the least. Um, so the Muddy Waters House will be presented to the Illinois Historic Sites Advisory Council next month. Um, and, and hopefully move forward then to review by the National Park Service. It's um, being uh, presented as eligible under Criterion B for performing arts uh, for its association with McKinley Morganfield, better known uh, by a stage name as Muddy Waters. The period of significance for the residents is from 1954, the year Morganfield first resided in the house to 1973, the year he moved out of the house and relocated to his last residence in Westmont, Illinois. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the residence is located about five miles south of Chicago's Loop in the Kenwood community area at 4339 South Lake Park Avenue. The building is located on the east side of Lake Park Avenue near the center of the block between East 43rd Street and East 44th Street. Next slide, please. Uh, the land was that the residence resides on was first sold in 1885, but it remained undeveloped until 1891. Um, it always served as a two flat uh, dwelling uh, from its from its first kind of development and to uh, Morgan Fields residence and his eventual um, leaving the, the residence. Um, it's obviously most notable as the residence for, of uh, McKinley Morgan Field, um, who owned and resided in the residence from 1954 to 1973, as I previously mentioned. After Morgan Field died in 1983, management of the residence fell to his former agent and its state executor, Scott Cameron, before it entered into receivership during the 1990s and ultimately fell vacant. It was during this period that the home was vandalized, um, stripped of any sal salvageable materials that, that could be resold, um, basically rendering the building uninhabitable and open to the elements. The house was finally acquired by Waters' great-granddaughter, Chandra Cooper, in 2002, who worked for two decades to secure and stabilize the vacant building. And she's currently working to establish the Mojo Museum in the residence to honor her great-grandfather. Next slide, please. I'm sure we all know who Muddy Waters is, um, but a, a brief um, history. Um, it, the residence had a really insignificant history until 1954 when uh, McKinley Morgan Field um, relocated his family from Chicago's near West Side community to the residence in Ken, Kenwood. Uh, regarded as the father of Chicago blues, Morgan Field was one of the most important figures in the development of the distinctive electrified sound that married the Delta blues from his home state of Mississippi with amplification to create a powerful new genre of urban blues unique to Chicago. Next slide, please. Morgan Field's home on Lake Park Avenue not only served as his, as his family's residence, but also as a rehearsal space and studio for his band. The basement was fitted out as a rehearsal studio with living quarters at the rear for family or friends, band members needing a place to stay after a late night rehearsal session, 
or as additional space to accommodate, accommodate the consistent influx of visitors, giving the residents its nickname as the House of Blues. Next slide, please. Uh, just to talk briefly about the architecture, um, it is a common brick two flat dwelling embellished with limited architectural ornamentation derived from the Queen Anne style. For the first 16 years um, of his time at the, at the resi residence on Lake Park, Morganfield did little to alter its original 1891 appearance. Over time, changes have altered the appearance of the exterior, though many were undertaken by Morganfield himself and have gained significance for their association with Morganfield. Some of these alterations include uh, the replacement of the original wood front porch um, with the existing porch that you see in the photos, the replacement of the ornamental sheet metal cladding at the bay window with flat sheet metal paneling and wood boards, uh, the removal of the original cornice, um, and then subsequently the parging of that parapet wall, and then uh, painting the front facade as well. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, as you can see, the building has been stripped down to just the, the studs. Um, what we do know remains intact is the original layouts of each floor. Um, the basement did have originally have some partition walls that separated the rehearsal studio from uh, the living quarters, but the those have been removed. You can see on in the photos on the left-hand side, it's completely open. And unfortunately that original layout is unknown and has been lost. New steel columns and a new um, steel beam were recently inserted uh, below the first floor framing in the basement to support, um, well, to stabilize the structure on the first floor. Um, at the first and second floors, the original layout uh, remains. Um, but again, all of it has been really stripped down to bare bones of the structure. The original wood floors remain, um, as well as some simple rectilinear trim at the first floor living room arch window, which you can see in the top center photo. Um, and the original stairs, uh, really the treads, risers, and stringer uh, between the basement and first floor and the first floor and the second floor are also intact. Next slide, please. A key component of this nomination, because so much has happened uh, to the actual residents, was studying the integrity of the, the residents and its eligibility for listing on the National Register. So we completed a comparison study of residences associated with Morgan Field um, to understand you know, the loss of integrity and is it the best intact residence associated with his life. Uh, we studied, you know, looking for an original location for water, uh, Morgan Field's birthplace, but it could not be determined. We know he was born in 1913 near Mayersville, Mississippi, in a small rural crossroads community of Jugs, Jugs Corner, located on the road between Mayersville and Rolling Fork. Next slide, please. So we traced that, that road based on early atlas maps and top, uh, topographic maps. Um, and then we surveyed kind of from Google Earth to see if we could find any traces of potential potential areas where that rural corners may have be may have been, um, but unfortunately we couldn't find any remnants possibly related to Jugs Corner. Next slide, please. Um, Morgan Field's location between 1914 and 1919 is unknown. By 1920, though, uh, possibly earlier, he lived on Belmont Belmont Plantation, also known as Stovall Farm approximately seven miles northwest of Clarksdale, Mississippi, where he lived with his grandmother, uh, Del Della Grant, in a log sharecropper's cabin, which you can see here. Um, after his passing in 1983, the then vacant cabin became a mecca for blues fans across the world. Unfortunately, a tornado in 1987 heavily um, destroyed the cabin. Um, and then it was threatened with demolition by the Mississippi Highway Department. And in 1990, the House of Blues dismantled what remained of the log cabin. Um, and it went on a, a traveling exhibit before it was permanently located in a wing of um, the Delta Blues Museum. Unfortunately, because of its re relocation from its original site, um, it has experienced a significant loss of integrity. Um, and as you can see, it's in, a, it's in a new setting and context that is completely different of, of where once was and you know there's 
just artifacts, uh, a reproduction of artifacts hanging, and it's just, it's not as, not the same. So it's lost significant integrity um, as compared to, you know, the integrity that still remains at 4339 South Lake Park Avenue. Next slide. Uh, you have spoken for nine minutes. Kim. Oh, okay. Sorry, I have, I have two slides left and we'll go really fast. Um, he arrived in Chicago, um, neither location before uh, his location at Lake Park Avenue remained, <clears throat> these are those two. Um, and then after Lake Park Avenue, he moved out to, oh, sorry, next slide, please. He moved out to Westmont and that house has also been completely remodeled and has lost integrity. Um, and it leaves 4339 as the best intact example of, um, of or related to Morgan Field today. Next slide, please. And I, that concludes a very brief overview of the nomination. Apologies, I went over. There's so much to, to talk about, um, but happy to answer any questions. Commissioner Burns, do you have any comments or questions? None, just enthusiasm for the continued vision to um, bring this building and Money Waters legacy to more people. So thank you to um, Ms. Ruggiero, certainly to Ms. Cooper, who has invested her heart and soul in this. Thank you. Uh, is Ms. Cooper present to wish to speak? I don't believe, I don't believe she um, was okay. able to join us today. We've, we've chatted with her a few times. I'd like to call for a vote on whether to recommend listing on the National Register for the building to the full commission. So moved, Second. and I suppose voted yes as well. Thank you. We, likewise, I sec, I vote. So we'll now move on to the next nomination. It's for Stone Temple Baptist Church at 3620-3624 West Douglas Boulevard. The nomination was prepared by Andrew Elders. Emily Ramsey will make the presentation. Uh, Ms. Ramsey, are you available? I am here, can you hear me? Yes. Great. <clears throat> Um, again, my name is Emily Ramsey with Ramsey Historic Consultants, and um, I'll be presenting the Stone Temple Baptist Church at 3620 to 3624 West Douglas Boulevard on behalf of Bauer Latosa uh, Studios and the um, author of the nomination, Andrew Elders. Next slide. Stone Temple Baptist Church was originally built in 1926 as a synagogue to house the former First Romanian Congregation founded by Romanian Jews that had, that had migrated to Chicago. Next slide. The building is located in Chicago's North Lawndale community, approximately 10 miles west of the loop. The building faces Douglas Boulevard at the intersection of Douglas Boulevard and Millard Avenue. Next slide. Stone Temple Baptist Church is listed as a contributing structure to the Chicago Park Boulevard System Historic District and is also a designated Chicago landmark. This individual nomination is required as part of a federal grant for building repairs. Next slide. Stone Temple Baptist Church is individually significant under Criterion A in the areas of social history and black heritage for its association with the civil rights movement in Chicago and under Criterion C for distinctive architecture. The period of significance for social history is 1954 to 1968, and the period of significance for architecture is 1926, the year of construction. Next slide. Although Stone Temple is a religious building, it meets National Register Criterion Consideration A for its significance under social history and architecture and does not derive its primary significance from its religious affiliations. Next slide. Stone Temple Baptist Church began its life as the first Romanian congregation synagogue. North Lawndale was a predominantly Jewish neighborhood in the early 20th century, and First Romanian was one of several important Jewish institutions in North Lawndale. Next slide. In 1925, the congregation commissioned architect Joseph Cohen to design its new synagogue. 
Next slide. The building was completed in 1926 and is an excellent example of a historic synagogue with a rare and eclectic mix of Romanesque, classical, and Moorish detailing. Next slide. So detail. Next slide. The synagogue was an important part of community life for the Romanian Jews in North Lawndale. During the 1930s and early 1940s, the congregation provided support and aid to Romanian Jews in Europe as Hitler's power grew. Next slide. Although architect Joseph Cohen designed at least one other synagogue, also in North Lawndale, seen here, First Romanian Synagogue, now Stone Temple, is his best known work. Next slide. After World War II, North Lawndale transitioned from a Jewish to an African-American community. In 1954, the first Romanian synagogue was sold to an African-American Baptist congregation led by Reverend James Marcellus Stone and rededicated as the Stone Temple Baptist Church. During the 1950s and 1960s, the church became one of Martin Luther King Jr.'s main centers of speaking and civil rights activism in Chicago as he shifted his crusade from the South to Northern cities. Next slide. Stone Temple was one of three churches that served as assembly points and organizations for King's 1960 March for Freedom during the Republican National Convention in Chicago, as shown here. Next slide. In 1965, King launched the Chicago Freedom Movement, which focused on eliminating slums and ending housing discrimination in Northern cities. King moved into an apartment building in North Lawndale, just blocks from Stone Temple, and the church was designated the West Side Action Center for the movement. Next slide. In the summer of 1966, King and the Chicago Freedom Movement led rallies and marches throughout Chicago neighborhoods where African-Americans were denied entry. Next slide. The Chicago Freedom Movement prompted national debate about housing discrimination that ultimately led to the passage of the Fair Housing Act of 1968, signed into law shortly after King's assassination. Stone Temple Baptist Church was at the center of the movement's efforts and its congregation has continued to play a major role in civil rights activism since King's death. Next slide. Uh, now I'm just gonna show some current images of the, of the Stone Temple Baptist Church. This is looking east along Douglas Boulevard. Next slide. The exterior of the building is intact with no major non-historic alterations or additions. Next slide. The original cornerstone is seen here for the synagogue at the southwest corner of the building. Next slide. And there's also a 1954 stone plaque that commemorates the year that Stone Temple Baptist Church moved into the building. Next slide. Again, this is the primary south facade with the three main entrances that faces Douglas Boulevard. Next slide. The west facade facing Millard Avenue. Um, you can see the window openings at the ground level have been infilled, but otherwise the facade retains its historic exterior features. Next slide. And this is a detail of the um, stained original stained glass windows, some of which have been replaced, but uh, most of which remain. Next slide. Also included in the National Register nomination is the two-story brick dining room structure that extends from the north elevation of the building. Um, a one-story building stood in 1911, and a second story was added in 1926 when the synagogue was built. Next slide. It's looking at the primary elevation of the dining room. Next slide. Like the exterior of the building, the interior retains good integrity with only minor alterations. This is looking towards the entrances at the ground floor entry vestibule of the synagogue. Next slide. The detail of an original stair and mule post. Next slide. Uh, looking towards the doors into the sanctuary at the vestibule. Next slide. I have a bunch of sanctuary photos, bear with me. <laughs> this is looking north on the main sanctuary level. Next slide. Uh, looking south towards the main entrance. Next slide. Looking east. Next slide. Um, the balcony level, and you can see some of the original light fixtures in the sanctuary. Next slide a detail of one of the um, stained glass windows. Next slide. Next slide. 
the original Torah Ark remains at the sanctuary chancel. Next slide. The dining room is more altered um, than the synagogue building. Um, the first floor interior has been altered with um, partitions and non-historic finishes. Next slide. But the second level uh, is more intact with original detailing remaining. Next slide. And that's the presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Commissioner Burns, do you have any comments or questions? No questions, pleased to see this moving forward. Does a representative for the owner wish to speak today? Hearing no one, I will call for a vote on whether to recommend listing uh, Stone Temple Baptist Church on the National Register for the building to the full commission. So moved and a yes vote for this um, very important building. I, I second it and I vote <clears throat> yes also. The committee's recommendation for this nomination will be considered by the full commission at its meeting on October 6, 2022. The next nomination is for the Slitz Brewery Tide House at 9401 South Ewing Avenue. The nomination was prepared by Elizabeth Blasius and Jonathan Solomon of Preservation Futures. Elizabeth Blasius will make the presentation. Good morning, Commissioner Tolliver. Good afternoon, Commissioner Tolliver. And Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Elizabeth Blasius. I'm co-founder of Preservation Futures, the authors of the a National Register nomination for the Schlitz Brewery Tide House at 9401 South Ewing Avenue. Um, we were hired by Mike Medina and Laura Coffey Medina to write this nomination. Um, as you know, this building is a designated Chicago landmark. It was designated in 2020. And it's also the recipient of a um, adopt a landmark funds. And uh, just as a full disclosure, I am a member of the Illinois Historic Sites Advisory Council. Um, so I will be, um, I will be um, excluding myself from this presentation during the ISAC meeting. My um, co-founder of Preservation Futures, Jonathan Solomon, will be presenting on our behalf. The next slide, please. The Schlitz Brewery Tide House is located at 9401 South Ewing Avenue on the corner of Ewing and 94th Street in Chicago's um, east side area, east side neighborhood. Um, the building is um, not, it was not rated on the Chicago Historic Resources Survey. Um, it, just to give you a background of the, um, in terms of its previous eligibility. Next slide, please. The building was built in 1907, designed by Charles Thislew um, and features renovations by William C. Presto, who is the, um, an architect of the renovation. The um, East Side Tap uh, slash Slitz Brewery Tide House um, joins in 2020, in 2020, it joined um, a number of other Tide Houses that were locally designated in Chicago. Um, a thematic district was established in 2011. Um, Chicago has approximately 40 to 50 total extant identified Tide Houses uh, representing a variety of breweries. Next slide, please. Um, sorry, I'm seeing the, uh, the Zoom presentation slowly. We are nominating the um, Slitch Brewery Tide House under National Register Criterion C for its architecture as a work of distinctive architecture and construction. Next slide, please. Um, the Schlitz Brewery Tide House has a remarkable amount of integrity. Um, it uh, exterior and interior, the only element sort of missing is the uh, leaded glass window, which was rem removed within the last few years. Uh, next slide, please. The Schlitzbury Tide House um, it conveys the original design intent of a Chicago neighborhood Tide House. Once listed on the National Register of Historic Places, the um, Schlitzbury Tide House will join only one other um, listed Tide House on the National Register of Historic Places, the Three Brothers Tide House in Milwaukee. 
Next slide, please. The Schlitzer Brewery Tide House was designed by the Youngstown, designed for use uh, by workers in um, the steel industry, um, particularly the Youngstown Steel Iroquois Works, which began its operation just north of the um, Schlitz Tide House uh, in 1890. Um, the, uh, the Tide House ran as a Tide House since, until 1919. When it when prohibition essentially um, it eliminated the tie house, tied house form, uh, because of that, and we are nominating it under Criterion C. Uh, next slide, please. The nomination does include some information on um, owners after the um, the tied house model was eliminated, including the um, the Popovich brothers, who were a family of Tamboritza Orchestra. They were an orchestra family, a, a band family essentially that um, worked in the steel mills and operated the bar and um, gigged on weekends. So the nomination includes information on Tamboritza music and its origins on the east side. Um, and it also, uh, next slide please. We also included some later information, including um, the building's history of ownership by um, JB and Francis Shirk, who renamed it JB's Bamboo Lounge in um, 1973. In 2017, the building was sold and the original leaded glass window um, was removed. The building was purchased by um, like Mike and Laura Medina. Next slide, please. In um, 2020, who are um, who have worked with the Chicago Landmarks Commission, Preservation Futures. Um, and, you know, of course, with the adopt a landmark funds to uh, bring the Schlitz Tide House back in operation for the people of the East Side. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry about the technical difficulties, but um, thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Commissioner Burns, do you have any comments or questions? I don't. Thank you. Thank you. Do the owners wish to speak today? If not, uh, I would call for a vote on whether to recommend listing this project on the National Register for the building to the full commission. So moved and I vote yes. I second it and I vote yes. The committee's recommendation for this nomination will be considered by the full commission at its meeting on October 6, 2022. The commission meeting is planned to be held virtually and details will be posted at the commission's website at www.chicago.gov ccl. After the October 6th meeting, the commission's recommendations will be sent to the Illinois Historic Sites Advisory Council, which reviews national register nominations for the entire state. Now the program committee will hear suggestions received by staff for new landmark designations since our last meeting on June 21st, 2022. I will announce each suggestion and call on the person who submitted it to identify themselves and the organization they represent, if any, and then make a brief statement regarding the suggestion. Please try to keep your comments and presentation, if any, to five minutes or less. When your name is called, please turn on your video and unmark, mute yourself so we can see and hear you. When the next agenda item is called, please turn your video off and mute yourself again. We would appreciate your remaining on mute unless your agenda item is being discussed so as to avoid unnecessary background noise during the meeting. Please be aware that no decisions concerning Chicago landmark designations will be made at today's meeting. I will call on the first suggestion, 5852 North Sheridan House, Leroy Blomart. Uh, yes, uh, Leroy Blomart. I'm, 
I'm a uh, resident of Edgewater. And in the slide presentation, you can see on the right-hand side, a photo taken before 1910, which was published in the book, Homes of the North Shore. And on the left, you can see the same building with its current state, uh, which is could be better, um, but I don't believe it, in, it, it adversely affects the integrity requirement in that the facade of the um, front porch could be repaired. Uh, none of us have been inside the house, but the, it is being marketed as a 450 square foot house with seven bedrooms and seven baths, which makes it significant more like a mini mansion than a house. So uh, why is this important? Well, on Sheridan Road, there are currently nine single family homes left and soon to be nine because one, the Wing Ho restaurant is slated for demolition. Um, and why is this particular one significant? Well, it's significant in its own right as a, as a mansion, but more importantly, it's the last remaining house on Sheridan Road that was built for J. Lewis Cochran, who was Edgewater's founder and major developer. And east of Broadway, there's only two others on Winthrop, but they don't have the same um, size or character that be, could be called a mansion. Um, so a uh, few other comments here, um, you know, there, I think it would be e relatively easy to add to the other la Chicago landmarks that are on Sheridan Road that were part of a non-contiguous landmark district. And these are the two in Burger Park and um, uh, one, two owned by Loyola, one being um, the, uh, what is it, the uh, Schmidt House. I should look at my okay, list here, yes, um, which, which, were which was designed by George Washington Mayor. So um, uh, do you have any questions? I don't. I, I, Commissioner Burns, do you have any questions? I don't, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. The next one is Kendrick Memorial Missionary Baptist Church located at 1107 West 79th Street. And Dr. Sher Sharon Patterson will speak. <clears throat> Good afternoon, um, Commissioner Chairman Tolliver and board. Um, Kendrick Memorial is located 1107 West 79th Street. We are in the Auburn Gresham neighborhood. And this development, this church was built in the 1930s. Um, Kendrick was established by Professor Alonzo Kendrick in 1938. He was a professor of um, music, piano, and organ. He later became the pastor of this church. It was once on um, 45th and Michigan, then they relocated to 69th Street, finally settling on 11 West 79th Street under his pastorship. That is the first picture you see in the upper right corner by the church. Um, the lower right is Reverend A.D. Spriggs who took pastoral ship and he organized a the Baptist Training, the Baptist Training um, Institute, Board of Christian Education, I'm sorry, where he was the leadership of schools and annual um, vacation Bible schools and things of that sort. Uh, next slide. Do we have a next slide? I don't know if I'm frozen. No, the, uh, all of the images are on the single slide. Okay. Um, just a brief um, history of the church. We've had several um, things done just to the doors, just a couple of things. It was a break-in once. It was glass doors. I don't have the picture of that. 
um, the only thing that was replaced on this beautiful architectural um, stone front church, which is the only one between 79th and State Street, um, all the way to 79th and Western. We are a community-based church. We serve as a uh, learning institute of spirituality. We serve the community, feeding the community, clothing the community. We stand as a pillar of five generations from the 1930s until the present time. Our present pastor is uh, Reverend Stanley J. Miller, which also grew up in that church under three generations of his family. Um, we're just asking to be considered as a national landmark for the community, for the, I don't know if you can see stone, the um, stained glass windows. It's not really a, a really close up picture. Uh, the stained glass windows are the original windows. The inside is, has been um, transformed a little bit to update some things and just keep functions working, things working. But the outside is the very original. And we're just asking for consideration um, to be a part of the landmark of the city of Chicago. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we're here. Uh, report. Uh, Reverend Tolliver, excuse me, Chairman. Yes. I have a question for Dr. I'm Patterson. Um, I'm just curious, what is your relationship with this uh, congregation and this building? I am a trustee of the church. I have been attending Kendrick Memorial Missionary Baptist Church since 1968. I also grew up wow. in that neighborhood. Um, I, my mom, myself, my daughter, my grandkids all attend this church and, and that's generations right there. And like I said, it's several generations of people that grew up there, had grandparents go there, they are there. It's just a community base and there's people in the neighborhood that also attend there. We're very well respected um, by the community. Uh, Father Mike, community development is working with us now. We're approved and we're gonna get the windows um, restored, not replaced, just restored um, after this process. But we are recognized in the community from State Street, like I said, until Western, we're very recognized. We're the Stone Church on 79th Street. Thank you for your advocacy and your commitment to this building. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, item is Wayman AME Church. Uh, Preservation Chicago will make a presentation. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is Max Chavez. I'm Director of Research and Special Projects at Preservation Chicago. Um, Preservation Chicago uh, is strongly recommending the landmarking of Wayman AME Church at 509 West Elm Street. Um, it was built in 1889 for the congregation of the First Swedish Baptist Church uh, when the surrounding area was known as Swedetown, which was a once sizable district of Swedish immigrants along the north branch of the Chicago River. Uh, the church was designed by Lewis and Eric J. Osling. These, and the structure itself possesses, a, as you can see, a pretty unique Romanesque appearance, uh, despite the lack of the two roof structures that originally sat atop its corner towers. You can see them uh, in the photo on the right. The uh, asymmetrical central gable um, that you'll see in the, the picture on the left uh, is a particular note, especially that sort of small checkerboard stone detailing at its, at its apex. On its other major elevation on the uh, north side of the church, there's some really interesting, uh, I guess you could call it experimentation with fenestration, uh, wherein there's all sorts of different window shapes and sizes employed, and it makes for a pretty exciting uh, sort of viewing experience. Um, there's also a three flat that's sort of executed in the same style as the church, and that's fused to the uh, west side of the structure. If you look sort of at the far right of the photo on the right, you can kind of see it in the background. It's a little small. Um, but there's some pretty interesting archways above the front door and first floor windows there that are particularly lovely. It's also one of the uh, few remaining structures designed by the Austin brothers that's still believed to be standing in Chicago. Um, the church served Sweet Towns Faithful for years after its completion, uh, but by 1920, as the neighborhood demographics changed, the church structure um, was eventually transferred to the ownership of Wayman African 
Methodist Episcopal Church or Wayman AME. Uh, soon, um, in the decades that follow, as the Cabrini Green Homes developed around the church, uh, the church became a, a hub for the community that sprang from this development. The church uh, and the leaders at the church became a sort of spokesperson for Cabrini Green residents, uh, and they were vocal advocates for improving the living conditions there, as well as issuing public calls for the advancement of civil rights for Black Americans. In many cases, the church was also one of the first community groups to issue statements uh, after community tragedies. In fact, the church was the backdrop uh, to the murder of seven-year-old Dontrell Davis, who was killed near Wayman AME while coming home from school. Um, so through the construction of Cabrini Green, their, their deterioration, and then their demolition, Wayman AME has served as a powerful grounding force for the surrounding area. Um, they've offered support and faith for Chicago's most well-known public housing development for, for many, many years. So yeah, taking this profound neighborhood importance along with its place in early Swedish Chicago history, uh, it's really wonderful architectural achievements um, and its significance as one of a handful of remaining Austin Brothers buildings, Wayman AME's potential as a new landmark building I, I feel is pretty clear. So um, Preservation Chicago really looks forward to one day hopefully seeing uh, Wayman AME as a deserving recipient of official uh, Chicago landmark designation status. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Barnum, do you have any questions? I don't, thank you, Mr. Chavez. I just have one. Are you doing this uh, in conjunction with the members of the church? Do they want this or is this something Preservation Chicago is pursuing not in conversation with the members? Uh, no, there is. There seems to be some agreement. I, I think um, our executive director, who will be on a little bit later, Ward Miller, will probably have a little bit more uh, information to share about uh, the conversations there. But no, this is not uh, something going on, uh, you know, separate from the church itself. Okay. The next uh, item is South Chicago Masonic Temple, twenty nine thirty nine East Ninety First Street, presented by Preservation Chicago. Um, I think, oh, okay, there we go. <laughs> I have no words giving this one. Good afternoon, uh, Commissioner Tolliver and Commissioner Burns, excuse me, Chairman Tolliver and Commissioner Burns. I'm Ward Miller, uh, Executive Director of Preservation Chicago. Uh, the South Chicago Masonic Temple was one of our Chicago seven uh, last year. And it's a really remarkable structure that's at the corner of 91st and, um, and Exchange Avenue. And we really um, would like to see this building considered for a Chicago landmark designation. It was once part of a large hub of structures at this corner, it was designed by Clarence Hatsfield um, in 1916 in the, uh, in the classical revival style. Um, uh, you know, the South Chicago Masonic Temple has unfortunately been empty for many years since its use as a Masonic Temple and then as a temporary home for the South Chicago, uh, Chicago Public Branch Library. It's really an amazing structure and uh, the Cook County Land Bank under the authority of Eleanor Gorski has, uh, is in the process of acquiring this structure. And uh, we do have the uh, blessings of uh, older woman Suzanne Garza uh, to consider this for a Chicago landmark designation. We feel this would be a great addition to what will soon become the 91st Street Arts Corridor in South Chicago, extending from this building to um, the park and the lakefront, actually. So originally, it was going to extend to Commercial Avenue, and now we've thought about it uh, extending to the lakefront. So this is really an important component, along with the building across the street, um, St. Peter and Paul Catholic Church and School, which is also uh, vacant. And we feel that uh, along with the uh, revitalization of the former YMCA further down the street, uh, linked with uh, the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe, that this would be a fantastic way to really kickstart uh, this corridor that has seen so much disinvestment over time. So with that and with and noting the uh, prominence of this building uh, to the South Chicago neighborhood, we want to offer this as a suggestion for a Chicago landmark designation. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Burns, do you have any questions? Uh, just a point of clarification, Mr. Miller. Did I hear you say that um, the Cook County Land Bank is in the process of acquiring 
um, ownership or receivership of this property? That's correct. That's correct. And uh, we've been in conversation with Eleanor Gorski and the staff at the Cook County Land Bank. And um, I think it's, uh, I can't really speak for them, uh, but it is my impression that there is a desire uh, to see this building preserved uh, and rethought, reused, along with its uh, wonderful uh, Masonic Hall on the upper floor and, um, and, trans and helping to transform this community. Thank you. So it's in, it's, I should say it's in process, Commissioner Burns. And then if I could address uh, uh, Commissioner Tolliver, Chairman Tolliver's um, question on Wayman AME Church. Uh, we are working with uh, residents of the Cabrini Green neighborhood, especially the Cabrini Row Houses um, and uh, Jaleesa Ford and uh, Ken Hammond, along with uh, the pastor of the church who has a secondary church on the uh, south side, it's sort of a sister church, if you will. Um, we're all working together with Alderman Burnett uh, to see this building reused. Uh, this would be AM, uh, Wayman AME as a community and uh, community arts center uh, for the, the area of the near north side and the former Cabrini Green um, vicinity. Uh, there's um, there's uh, been a, a loss of life. Uh, um, both both uh, both Jalisa and Ken have lost children to to violence, and uh, they are both committed to the idea of working with uh, the pastor of Wayman Amy Church to make that uh, a community center um, that would benefit all the children and adults in the community. So we're doing this in partnership with everyone, uh, Chairman Tolliver, just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. The next item is Washington Park National Bank, 6300 South Cottage Grove Avenue, the presentation will be made by Preservation Chicago. Thank you, Chairman Tolliver and uh, Commissioner Burns. I'm Ward Miller, Executive Director of Preservation Chicago. Uh, the Washington Park National Bank was also one of our Chicago Seven uh, from two years ago. And uh, we wish to see this uh, nominated as a Chicago landmark. Uh, the structure was a cornerstone of a once bustling commercial area at 63rd and Cottage Grove and has experienced a half a century of, of much disinvestment. And we feel that this, again, much like the South Chicago uh, Masonic Temple, could be a cornerstone to the revitalization of this community in this area of West Woodlawn in particular. Uh, this, this, this former bank building uh, not only housed uh, several banks over its lifetime, but its upper floors offered uh, medical offices to the community. Its first floor uh, was known for its uh, retail, uh, uh, particularly along 63rd Street, and then wrapping the corner onto Cottage Grove Avenue. Uh, it's an amazing structure. This is another building that the Cook County Land Bank has acquired and is wanting to transfer to uh, DL3, who a developer in Chicago, and uh, with the requirement that the facade uh, be saved and integrated into a new development uh, behind, uh, which would uh, integrate much of the facade along uh, Cottage Grove Avenue and 63rd Street in its fullness, uh, with the idea that perhaps uh, a new structure would grow out of the former uh, banking court, which is sort of centered in the middle of this uh, um, donut shaped building, if you will. Uh, so we are very hopeful that uh, this will all proceed forward. And um, we've worked with Eleanor Gorski staff at the Cook County Land Bank. We've been in conversations with um, um, Leon of DL3, the principal. And uh, we are very hopeful that this will be uh, considered for a Chicago landmark designation um, and that um, it'll be a cornerstone uh, in the redevelopment of the West Woodlawn community. We also wanted to mention that uh, this is just several blocks from the Emmett Till and Mamie Till Mobley House uh, that we were very instrumental in uh, encouraging a landmark designation of, as well as uh, honoring uh, the, the site as a museum. And we feel that uh, uh, talking to the Till family, uh, that this must have been very much a part of um, the community at one time. And um, just sort of honoring that great legacy, not only architecturally and historically and culturally, but um, trying to encourage this building be a landmark 
um, to, to, to sort of start a new day uh, for this corner and encourage uh, uh, positive redevelopment, which will help the community in, in the long run. We do, we have reached out to uh, Alderwoman Taylor, and I don't want to speak for her, but in the past, uh, it appears as though she's been supportive of this reuse idea and uh, and also the, the concept and idea of making this a Chicago landmark. Again, I don't want to speak on behalf of the aldermen, but uh, the conversations have been very positive in the past. So with that, uh, we wanted to offer this unique building as a suggestion for landmark. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Burns, do you have any comments or questions? No questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you. St. Albert Church, Preservation Chicago. Uh, hello again, uh, this is Max Chavez, uh, Director of Research and Special Projects at Preservation Chicago. Um, Preservation Chicago enthusiastically uh, supports the much needed landmarking of St. Adelbert Church in Pilsen, uh, which still remains at a critical stage of threat after years of, of inaction. This church has been a Chicago 7 most endangered on three separate occasions. Uh, and I think pretty much everyone can agree it's really one of the grandest and most impressive in all of Chicago. Um, it's been shuttered for years. It still today faces an uncertain future. Uh, a little background on the church, it was built over a two year period between 1912 and 1914, uh, designed by architect Henry J. Schlacks. Schlacks is widely recognized as the most accomplished religious architect in Chicago history. Uh, among the many churches he designed, uh, he was responsible for St. Mary of the Lake, uh, St. Ida, uh, St. Martin de Tours and Englewood this is also heavily endangered at this moment. Um, the parish of St. Adelbert was established for the Lower West Side's burgeoning Polish population and was only the third Polish national parish in Chicago at the time of its establishment. After the appointment of Reverend Kasmir Gronkowski in 1904 uh, to the parish, the construction of a new large scale church building was pursued. Uh, Gronkowski eventually commissioned Schlacks for the church's design. And he uh, worked closely with the architect to design um, the interior of St. Adelbert, including going to Italy, uh, interestingly enough, together to source the Carrara marble that was used throughout the building. Um, this marble was also used to replicate uh, Michelangelo's famous La Pietà, uh, which sits inside the church. Uh, the version you, you see actually inside of the church was made by, um, was made in Italy by Italian craftsmen using a plaster cast of the original Pietà itself. Uh, from its completion onward, St. Adelbert was a center of Polish religious life in and around Pilsen for many decades. Uh, in addition to its uh, Catholic mass, it also gave rise to numerous organizations including the uh, Polish Roman Catholic Union, the Polish Women's Alliance, the Polish National Alliance, uh, the area's first Polish newspaper, and the first dramatic circle south of downtown Chicago. Um, by the 1970s, as Pilsen became uh, increasingly Mexican, St. Adelbert continued to serve the neighborhood, eventually offering mass in Spanish. Uh, there was a 1974 threat of closure, which prompted really the earliest grassroots attempt to protect the church from abandonment uh, or worse, eventually succeeding in keeping the church open for many more decades to come. Uh, however, uh, the church did recently close, as, as we know, um, and there's been little in the way of indicating what's, what's coming next for the church. Uh, so this recommendation for landmarking is coming at a really crucial time. Uh, and, and you may have seen that there are currently attempts by uh, the Archdiocese to remove the statue uh, that I mentioned earlier of La Pieta from within the church by cutting sort of through the external wall, through the brick to get into uh, the statue itself. Um, these attempts to pick away at the architectural and artistic value of one of our most significant churches really show, I think that we're coming to a pretty crucial juncture here with regards to the safety of this church and its overall integrity. Um, as you may have seen, there's currently a very dedicated group of St. Adelbert parishioners uh, who are defending this church um, from, you know, really the sort of vandalism with overnight vigilance, which I think is incredible uh, and, and really demonstrates just how much of a bedrock this church is for the surrounding community. Um, so we can, we can see what's happening to the church today uh, without any landmark protections. So it's crucial that we save this building now with landmark status uh, while we have a chance um, and just ensure that it continues to exist as a really valuable community resource, uh, much as it has functioned as for well over a century. Thank you so much. Thank you. Commissioner Burns, do you have anything you'd like to say? 
Just a comment. I appreciate Preservation Chicago, your um, nomination and going through thoughtful and respectful channels to bring this to the commission's attention as opposed to the individuals who hijacked another um, property of importance at our, ma our main commission meeting earlier this month. And thank you, Reverend Tolliver, for um, providing a little bit of perspective on what are the opportunities for individuals to be heard, but also not at the expense of another property. So I appreciate this path as opposed to what has happened previously this month. Thank you. We thank you all for your suggestions and for taking the time to share your thoughts and information with us. All of the suggestions will now be given to Historic Preservation Division staff for further review. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you for attending. Goodbye. <laughs>